Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now without further ado, let's go. A few weeks ago, I filled out an online form to give back some money that was rightfully mine. It wasn't much, just about $47 for some unclaimed property I had. I didn't think much of it at the time. I mean, who wouldn't want to give back money they didn't even know they had? Everything seemed to be going smoothly. I got an email saying my refund was approved and I was feeling pretty good about it. But then out of nowhere, I got this letter in the mail from the Texas Comptroller. Now, I am not one to get excited about mail from government offices, but this one really threw me for a loop. The letter said they were keeping my $47 because I supposedly owed $35,000 in unpaid child support. Yeah, you heard that right. $35,000. I nearly fell out of my chair when I read that. Now, let me tell you something about myself. I'm a widow. My husband passed away back in 2015, and it's been just me and my kids ever since. I've never been divorced, never had to deal with custody battles or anything like that. I've always had full custody of my children, and I haven't even worked in over a decade. So, you can imagine how confused I was. I sat there staring at this letter trying to make sense of it all. Who did they think I owed this money to? Where did they even come up with this number? It was like they had me mixed up with someone else entirely. This whole mess reminded me of something that happened right after my husband died. I got this big packet in the mail addressed to him, talking about how he needed to pay child support. I remember thinking what in the world at the time. I had to call him up and explain that we weren't getting divorced, that he had passed away. They were really nice about it, apologized for the mix-up and said they'd take care of it. I thought that was the end of it. But here I was, years later, dealing with the same nonsense all over again. Only this time, they were saying I was the one who owed money. It just didn't make any sense. I decided to call up my friend Ava to see if she had any ideas. Hey Ava, you're not gonna believe what just happened. What's up? You sound stressed. I just got this crazy letter saying I owe $35,000 in child support. What? That's insane. How is that even possible? I have no idea. I am as confused as you are. But you've never even been divorced. And your kids have always been with you, right? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's like they've got me mixed up with someone else. Have you tried calling them to sort it out? Not yet. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. I mean, where did they even get this $35,000 figure from? I haven't worked in years. That's really weird. Maybe it's some kind of computer glitch? I don't know, but I'm going to have to figure it out. They are holding on to my refund because of this. Your refund? How much was it for? Only $47, but it's my money, you know? Absolutely, this whole thing sounds ridiculous. Let me know if you need any help dealing with it. Thanks, Ava. I appreciate it. After talking to Ava, I decided I needed to dig a little deeper into this mess. I remember that after my husband died, one of the first things I did was file for social security survivor benefits for me and my kids. It was around that time that I got that weird packet about child support addressed to my late husband. Something else came to mind. When I got the survivor benefit information, it was addressed to me using my maiden name. At the time, my parents thought that might have triggered the whole child support thing. They figured maybe the state saw my name change back to my maiden name and assumed I was getting divorced. It seemed far-fetched, but at that point, I was willing to consider any explanation. I mean, how else could you explain this mess? I decided to call the attorney general's office again. I was hoping they could shed some light on the situation. Hello? I am calling about a letter I received saying I owed child support. I think there has been a mistake. Office worker tells me, certainly. I'll be happy to help. Can you provide me with some information? Of course. My name is X and I received a letter saying I owe $35,000 in child support. But I'm a widow and I've never been divorced. I see. Let me look into this for you. Can you hold for a moment? Sure, take your time. After a few minutes of waiting and listening to some truly awful hold music, the worker came back on a line. Thank you for your patience. I've looked into your case and it appears there has been an error in our system. An error? Kind of error. It seems that when your husband passed away and you filed for survivor benefits, 
our system mistakenly flagged you as a divorced parent. The $35,000 figure appears to be an arbitrary amount generated by the system. But how is that possible? I've never even been to court for anything like this. I understand your confusion. It's a rare glitch in our system, but it does happen occasionally. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience this has caused you. So, what happens now? I'm going to clear this from your record right away. You should receive your refund within the next 7 to 10 business days. Again, I apologize for this mix-up. Thank you. I appreciate your help. After hanging up, I was glad to have it sorted out, but I couldn't believe a simple computer glitch could cause so much stress and confusion. Over the next few days, I not only got my $47 refund, but the office also sent me a formal apology letter and a $500 compensation for the stress and inconvenience caused. I've been a local news reporter for about 5 years now, covering everything from city council meetings to high school sports. But lately I've been focusing on a series of stories about people misusing disabled parking spots. It's become a real problem in our town and I've gotten tons of calls and emails from folks who are fed up with it. My tale starts when I got a tip from a teacher at Westfield High School and she told me that parents were constantly parking in a disabled spot to pick up their kids. Even though they didn't have permits, I decided to check it out myself. So there I was, camera in hand, ready to do a field report on the issue. I've been to the school before for other stories, but this time I was on a mission. I sat up near the parking lot waiting for the end of the school day when parents would start showing up. And that's when I saw her. This woman in a shiny SUV pulls up and, I kid you not, parks across two disabled spots. Just blatantly takes up both of them like she owns the place. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was like God had gift wrapped the perfect example for my story. I turned to my cameraman and said, Again this? He nodded, already rolling. I walked over to the woman as she was getting out of her car. Excuse me, ma'am, I said, holding out my microphone. I'm doing a report on the misuse of disabled parking spots. I couldn't help but notice you parked in not one but two of these spots. Do you have a disabled parking permit? The woman, who I will call Karen because that's exactly who she was, looked at me like I just asked her to solve a complex math equation. What? No, I don't need a permit. I'm just picking up my daughter. I tried to keep my cool. Ma'am, these spots are reserved for people with disabilities who have proper permits or placards. It's not legal to park here without one, even for a short time. Look, I don't have time for this. Only losers need permits. And I'm not a loser. Ma'am, that's a very insensitive thing to say. People with disabilities aren't. Before I could finish, Karen reached out and shoved my microphone. It flew out of my hand and clattered to the ground. I was shocked. Hey, you can't do that. Karen just turned and started walking away. I couldn't believe it. I called after her. Stop. You can't just leave after what you've done. And that's when things got even crazier. Karen whirled around. Marsh right up to me and slapped me across the face. Hard. I stumbled back, more surprised than hurt. Mind your own business, you nosy little man. Then she stormed off into the school, leaving me standing there, my cheeks stinging and my mouth hanging open. My cameraman lowered his camera and came over to me. You okay, boss? I nodded, still a bit dazed. Yeah, I'm fine. Did you get all that? He grinned. Every second of it. I picked up my mic and dusted it off. Well, I guess we got our story. We waited around, figuring Karen would have to come back out eventually. Sure enough, about 15 minutes later, she emerged with a teenage girl, who I assumed was her daughter, but they weren't alone. Two police officers were waiting for them. Turns out someone in the school had seen what happened and called the police. I hadn't even thought to do that myself. I was so caught up in the moment. As soon as Karen saw the officers, her Face went white. The girl looked confused and scared. Ma'am, we need you to come with us. What? Why? I haven't done anything wrong. We have reports of assault and property damage. Please turn around and put your hands behind your back. This is ridiculous. I'm just here to pick up my daughter. The daughter started crying, looking back and forth between her mom and the officers. Mom, what's going on? It's okay, sweetie. These men are making a mistake. Call your father. The officers weren't having any of it. They cuffed Karen and started leading her to their patrol car. The daughter was full on sopping now. 
It's going to be okay, miss. We've already contacted your father. He's on his way to pick you up. I felt bad for the kid, but what can I do? Officers, I'd like to press charges. This woman assaulted me and damaged my equipment. We'll need you to come down to the station to give a statement. I nodded. Of course. As I put Karen in the back of the patrol car, she stared at me through the window. I just stared back thinking about all the people with actual disabilities who struggled to find parking because of entitled people like her. The whole incident was over in less than an hour, but its impact lasted much longer. My story aired last night and it went viral online. People were outraged by Karen's behavior and applauded the quick action of the police. In the days that followed, I learned more about what happened to Karen. She was charged with assault, destruction of property, and illegal parking. The school banned her from campus, meaning she couldn't pick up her daughter anymore. Her husband had to take time off work to handle school pickups and Karen's legal troubles. But the story didn't end there. The mayor announced a new initiative to crack down on violators, increasing fines, and implementing a volunteer monitoring program. One woman, a wheelchair user, told me, every time someone without a permit uses a disabled spot, they are essentially saying their convenience is more important than our basic needs. That quote stuck with me. It became the centerpiece of a follow-up story I did, highlighting the daily challenges faced by people with disabilities in our community. In the end, the story wasn't really about Karen or me or even disabled parking spots. It was about how one small confrontation can spark a moment. And that's why I became a reporter in the first place, to shine a light on issues that matter and hopefully make our country a little bit better in the process. I'm a pretty easygoing guy. I work in IT and I've always been the type to help others out when they are in a jam. That's probably why I put up with the whole mess for as long as I did. In the early 2000s, I'd had my cell number for about 4 years at that point. I was working long hours trying to climb the corporate ladder and my phone was my lifeline. One night, around 2 a.m., I got a call from someone speaking rapid-fire Chinese. I couldn't understand the word, but I tried to explain they had a wrong number. They didn't get it and kept calling back. At first, I thought it was just a one-time thing, but then it kept happening. Every few weeks, I get these calls at all hours, but mostly between midnight and 3 a.m., it was driving me crazy, I was losing sleep, which made me cranky at work. My boss started giving me weird looks, probably thinking I was slacking off. After about 6 months of this torture, I finally got a call that shed some light on the situation. It was from a legal assistant to some lawyer named Colin. She explained that there was a typo on his business card. A 2 instead of a 3 in the phone number. And guess whose number it was? Yep, mine. So, you're telling me I've been getting these calls because of a typo? Yes, I'm afraid so. We were hoping you could just give the callers the correct number. Most of these people don't speak English. How am I supposed to do that? We understand it's an inconvenience. We'll try to correct the cards when we hand them out. Can't you just print new ones? We ordered a large batch and it would be wasteful to throw them out. We'll do our best to fix the issue. I wasn't happy, but what could I do? For a while, the calls stopped, and I thought the nightmare was over. I was wrong. They started up again, even more frequent than before. Every two or three days, multiple times a day, at all hours, I was at my wit's end. I decided to call Colin himself. Maybe he could put an end to this madness. Mr. Colin, I've been getting calls meant for you for months now. It's disturbing my life. Can you please do something about it? I apologize for the inconvenience, for a small immigration law firm and my legal assistant who is handling this has quit. I'm too busy to remember to correct the cards every time. Can't you just get new cards printed? That's not feasible right now. Could you just try to give the callers the correct number? But most of them don't speak English. I've been trying, but just do your best. And then he hung up on me. I was furious. This guy was basically telling me to deal with his problem because he was too cheap and lazy to fix it himself. I tried for a few more months to help these callers, but it was useless. They didn't understand me, and they just keep calling back. One day, I was at the mall with some friends when inspiration struck. A lady at a kiosk asked if we wanted to enter a contest to win a trip. My friend warned me it was probably a timeshare scam, but that's when I had my brilliant idea. 
I entered Colin into that contest and every other contest I could find at the mall. For the next eight months, I made it my mission to enter Colin into every contest, sweepstakes, and giveaway I could find. I'd do it during my downtime at work, sometimes 5 to 11 entries a day. Whenever I was out shopping, I'd look for more opportunities to sign him up. My co workers thought I was nuts. But when I explained the situation, most of them were on board. In fact, my boss's nephew, who was working with us that summer for high school credit, thought it was hilarious and started helping me out. Nephew says, Hey, I found this website with like 50 different sweepstakes. Want me to enter Colin and all of them? Absolutely. Make sure you use his work email and phone number. You got a boss. This guy's gonna be drowning in spam for years. As a month went by, I started to feel a little guilty, but then I get another 2 a.m. call from a confused Chinese speaker and my resolve would harden. Colin had brought this on himself. Finally, after about 8 months of my relentless campaign, the calls stopped. I checked online and found out that Colin changed his cell phone number. But the story doesn't end there. A few weeks later, I got a call from a number I did not recognize. Hello? Is this a person who's been getting my calls? Yes, it is. I see you've changed your number. I had to. Do you have any idea what you've done? I'm getting hundreds of calls and emails every day about contests I never entered. Timeshare companies won't leave me alone. I've had to hire someone just to manage all the spam. Wow, that sounds really inconvenient. Almost as inconvenient as getting woken up at 2am several times a week for over a year. This is completely unprofessional and childish. I could sue you for this. For what? Entering you in some contests? I was just trying to help you win some prizes. Maybe you could use one of those free trips to take a vacation and relax a little. You! You! Have a nice day, Colin. And hey, if you ever need help with your phone number again, don't call me. I hung up feeling pretty good about myself. Was it pity? Absolutely. But sometimes you have to fight fire with fire. Or in this case, fight annoyance with annoyance. And me? I finally got a good night's sleep. Alright, let me tell you about the time my country cousins visited and we had quite the adventure at a Chinese buffet. I'm a city guy, but my cousins, they are as country as they come. Every summer they'd visit for a week and it was always like watching fish out of water. This particular summer, I decided to treat them to the fanciest Chinese buffet in town. You should have seen their faces when we walked in. Eyes wide, the saucers, taking in all the sights and smells. We were loading up our plates when my youngest cousin Billy realized he didn't have any utensils. Now, Billy is not the brightest, bless his heart. Instead of looking for a utensil station, he walked up to the first Asian person he saw, a lady in a red dress, clearly another customer. Excuse me, ma'am, could I get some of them chopsticks? The lady looked up confused at first, then annoyed. I don't work here. Billy's face turned redder than a sweet and sour sauce. He scurried back to our table looking mortified. What happened, Billy? Couldn't find the chopsticks? I, I asked that lady for some, but she don't work here. I couldn't help it. I burst out laughing. The sheer absurdity of the situation was too much. My other cousins joined in, and soon we were all in stitches. It ain't funny. How was I supposed to know? Billy, not every Asian person in a Chinese restaurant, works there. That's like assuming every person wearing a cowboy hat back home works on a ranch. We kept teasing Billy throughout the meal. As we were leaving, he spotted the lady again and to his credit, went to apologize. Ma'am, I'm real sorry about earlier. I ain't used to fancy city restaurants and I made a fool out of myself. The lady's expression softened. It's alright. We all make mistakes. Just remember, we're all here to enjoy a good meal, whether we're serving it or eating it. That day of the Chinese buffet became a family legend. Even now, 20 years later, whenever we get together, someone always brings it up. Hey, Billy, can you ask that guy over there for some chopsticks? And we all burst into laughter all over again. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.